welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast, which also serves as the Game 7 post-game podcast. And the Raptors are going to the Eastern Conference Finals to face the Cavaliers. Tim Chisholm joins me. Hey, man. How are you doing? How long have you been following the Raptors? Since day one. Day one. Same here, man. Same here. Yeah. Uh, This is the high moment, I think it's safe to say, uh, for, for Raptor fans everywhere, including you and me. Yeah. Oh, easily. It's funny. I was just chatting with a couple of my friends who I'd watched the uh, conference finals with 15 years ago when Vince missed that shot. So we're all sort of commiserating that it took 15 years, but it finally went our way. Yeah. And this was like set up to be just like that game seven, you know, Mm -hmm. it's been a tight series all whole series long. Every game has been like two to three points here and there. Yeah. And like you had like uh, the, the heat experience being a big factor coming into this coming into this game and the Raptors haven't been great at holding on to leads. So mm-hmm. when it was like eight, nine in that fourth quarter, you know, I in know. previous games, the Raptors have basically just run the possession down to four and five seconds and taken a bad shot. And mm-hmm. I was like, are we about to see a repeat? But no, it was something totally different happened. It was, this was like, you felt it watching the game. that There's some sort of switch that has gone off with that team in terms of them understanding how, to seize the moment and how to seize the opportunity. It it reminded me so much of in that, uh, in the, in the 2001 playoffs, when in the game four and five against the Knicks, Vince just got it. You know, he'd played terribly the year before he played terribly for the first few games in that series. And then you just see this light bulb go off and it's like, Oh, this is how you play at this level. It was so cool to see. Yeah, and, and Kyle Lowry, obviously, is, is is our MVP here. He has been. I think we all knew that for us to have a successful playoff run, this guy had to be big. And we mm-hmm. got away with it against Indiana with him not being big. But against Miami, you definitely needed him. And in that fourth quarter, man, he was, you know, all that talk of, like, Dragic having a good series and <laughs> perhaps being better than him and all that just was put to rest where he just took the game over and... Uh, and, and his interplay with Bismack Biombo just all series long has just been... But just talk about Kyle Lowry, man, as a, like his growth from being essentially being somebody who who teams are reluctant to even include in their roster because of his mm. uh, his uh, his issues off the court or his attitude issues, I should say, uh, to him being, at this point, like maybe not the top tier NBA player, but definitely a, a tier two NBA player. Yeah, it's it's incredible because, again, it's... It's funny that you're dealing with a guy that it happens to him, not late in his career, but like it took him till he got to his prime when it all just sort of came together for him. He, for this team, he has been head and shoulders above any other kind of leadership best player guy that the Raptors have ever had. I mean, Bosch and Vince are, are sublime players and all the rest. But in terms of a guy who does it on the court in the box score, but also leads the team and is the heart and soul of the team and and drags the team along and, and keeps them focused. It's, it's, it's night and day compared to who he was. And I think even when Colangelo had gotten him from Houston and there was this idea, okay, finally a good starting point guard, you know, he'll be like that kind of guy who could anchor the position. But I mean, where he's come to, I don't know that anybody could have ever predicted the, uh, the impact he'd have on this franchise. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, he may not be the most talented player the Raptors ever had. Maybe Vince Carter goes, it goes, goes to him, but he is the combination of Charles Oakley, Antonio Davis, and a whole chunk of talent from Vince Carter combined into one player. And you just knew that it didn't sit right with him the way he played in game one. And even on ESPN today, they showed footage of him going into the gym after game one, shooting shots and, and how much it meant to him that uh, that he played poorly. And for just to see him come back and redeem himself and lead the team, you got to feel obviously great as a Raptor fan for seeing your team in the Eastern Conference Finals. But even for Kyle Lowry to see him become this this player that that like we're, it's so amazing to have a character like him, a player like him on the Raptors. And, uh, you know, going against, uh, coming up against Cleveland, yeah, we, we don't have a chance. That, that's what the people are saying. But with him, you always have this you-never-know factor. Yeah. I mean, he's a total wild card at this point because it's funny with a guy like that is we've never really seen him do this before, you know? And so, like, yeah, I don't really think that, that they're going to put too, too much of a scare into Cleveland. But I think at the very least, you've now gone into a position where, You've got to look at him as a variable that you can't pencil in for anything because he's just consistently up to the quality of his game throughout these entire playoffs. And he's given Cleveland trouble. You know, this is not a guy that is, is, is been typically dominated by Cleveland. He has been a problem for Cleveland. He has been a problem for Kyrie Irving. And it's going to be something that they're going to actually have to really game plan for because if he's finding his groove now, you know, that's 
a problem. And I think that Cleveland probably has the weapons to to uh, to help on it. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a far cry from the thought after like game two, game three in the Miami series of where you thought Toronto would be if they were able to get through the series. Yeah. Well, let's rewind a little bit and talk about game seven here. Uh, what, what was your prediction going into game seven? I was pretty confident they were going to win. I think even when we were setting this up, I had, I had sort of said that like, I'm, I'm, you know, let's do the game seven one. I'll, I'll, I'll do it with that confidence that we're going to be talking about going into another series and not uh, lamenting another season being over. It, it's, I don't know why, you know, it just certainly doesn't play to their history, but I was very, very certain they were going to lose game six and felt very, very confident they'd win game seven. There's just the team when their back is against the wall in these playoffs have found ways to elevate themselves. And it's sort of like you said, especially when it came to Kyle Lowry, but these guys seem willing to work to figure it out. They seem willing to work to sort of to get themselves in a position to win these games. And I think that you saw them come out like they have not played better in the entire playoffs than they did today. And and their focus and I don't know, it, it just it seemed like this is where they were heading. And it might have been, you know, optimism or even blind optimism. But yeah, coming into the game, I thought that this was this was theirs to lose. Yeah. No, I think after game six, when they lost, uh, I was kind of giving the edge to Miami. Um, and mm. you're right. I mean, the Raptors are 6-0 and now after losses, haven't lost back-to-back -back games in the postseason. It's just the experience edge and the ref's edge I thought might go to Miami. Um, but uh, but no, it wasn't to be, man. I was the, the Raptors were actually dominant in the in the second half, especially in the fourth quarter to, to take this away. Uh, you know, after game six, my main, I wasn't even sorry about losing game six. Like that wasn't upsetting me. I was just thinking back to game four. Mm. And how we should have ended, how we that that should have been the decisive game of the series where the Raptors took a three-one lead. So mm -hmm. the, the aftermath of Game Six was more lamenting about Game Four, which is weird because that that's a game that uh, where the big versus small thing was introduced for the first time with Dwayne Casey benching Bismack Biombo and and the Heat taking advantage of that, and that carried over to Game Six, which Miami, Miami won handily. But in Game Seven, Casey, um, w what did you think about him sticking to his gun, going with Pat Patterson and Biombo? against Miami's small lineup. What did, what, what did you make of the whole thing? I liked it. I mean, I was I, I haven't been tweeting too, too much during the series, but I was aghast when he took Biombo out of that game. And so this time, the fact that he stuck with them and had very clearly instructed the team to go hard at the basket every time because there are no shot blockers there. Don't rush, don't force it, you know, but because you don't need to. You've got the personnel and you've got the time on the clock, get to the basket and letting them uh, Biombo and Patterson out there to actually focus on getting rebounds or at least focus on getting the box out so the guards could get the rebounds. Uh, it, for me, size is always the advantage in the NBA unless you have great shooting. Miami yeah. does not have great shooting. Exactly. Yeah. So the size should absolutely swing the series in Toronto's favor. And it felt like today was the first time when they understood the the, the extreme of that truth. Yeah. And I thought that uh, Dwayne Casey has been criticized in the past for essentially giving into the type of a game the opposition wants to play, mm -hmm. uh, and not being not enforcing his own advantage on the opposition, but always playing basically the pace and style the opposition wants to play. And I think the fact that he resisted that urge to go small and stuck with Biombo despite some of the problems we saw in uh, in Game Six was something big. I think it's, it's, you're seeing a sign of growth from the from the coach as well and rebounding is my is my big thing here the rappers were 50 30 plus 20 yeah. in rebounding uh in, in this game and we we made miami pay for going small we didn't mm. do that in game six i i thought we were way too aggressive covering their perimeter guys way too far out from the rim and today we didn't do that and we essentially stuck to the paint and we dominated them 50 30 on the offensive glass bismack biombo who has just been, I mean, sign him to the max, whatever it takes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Biombo was, was 16 rebounds here, six offensive. And what can't be understated is the, the, how, it, how those offensive rebounds deflated Miami in the fourth quarter and how much his pick and roll dunks and power jams essentially sucked the soul out of uh, Josh McRoberts and Dwayne Wade. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, he, I mean, I think the thing, when, when you play a game like this, if you're Miami and Lowry goes off, you know, you sort of get it. I mean, he's an all-star. But when a guy like Biombo is now absolutely deflating you every time down the court, I think that's what punches you in the gut emotionally. You know, those are the kinds of guys that, I mean, and as, as, as like having been watching the Raptors for years, there's a whole laundry list of players who've done that to the Raptors. And it's these sort of secondary guys, these tertiary guys who 
come in and just abuse every advantage that they have against the team. And Biombo, this game was spectacular. And I think you're right. I think it was the offensive rebounds, the sort of ceaseless offensive rebounds. I mean, what did the, the team ended up with 20 offensive rebounds in this game. And it's how do you not just like just just sink your head every single time if you're Miami because you can't be giving up extra shots to the team uh, when basically the games have been even scores almost yeah. the entire series. Yeah. And and I mean the, the Heat shot 45% in their game and only had uh, like 13 turnovers. That's not a high number for them. If you if you put those two stats together, decent shooting, low mm-hmm. turnovers, this should be advantage Miami because they're playing small ball. Uh, their three let them down. They're only seven for 25 in this game, which was which is big. I, I thought the Raptors just sagging off of Richardson and uh, and Winslow was big. I mean, there's no reason to guard them. They're two rookies. If they if they're gonna beat you, you know, from from the long distance jumper uh, in in this game, so be it. But you you can't possibly come out and check them there. And I think we also benefited from uh, not in this game necessarily, but throughout the series. Joe Johnson and Luol Deng having subpar series. Credit mm-hmm. to the Raptors defense there. I thought I thought our man Terrence Ross. Was was pretty big tonight, especially defensively. Yeah, I agree. You know what? I mean, you know, I have I have slagged no one as bad as on this team as I have Terrence Ross, but he's had like a number of moments in these playoffs where he has like, had a, like a significant impact. And you know, I mean, the turnovers drive me bonkers, but it's uh, but no, I think on the whole, he's been a net positive for the team, and the defense was huge because the Raptors really, really, really limited the minutes to their bench in this game. And so whoever was out there when they were out there had to perform. And to, to Ross's credit, he absolutely did. And um, yeah, and, and considering that he was basically for the last two playoffs, a total write off, I think, that, again, growth up and down the roster. Yeah. And, and credit to Dwayne Casey. I mean, again, he's been, you know, in the past, he's, he's had a short rotation where he doesn't give time to guys who are unproven. But he tinkered here. He gave James Johnson some minutes, at the, you know, meaningful minutes in game six. He got Jason Thompson off the bench to, to, to be productive here and there. Today he had a horrible stretch there. But at least he went to him. He even went to Bebe in, uh, you know, for a couple of games. So it's not just – there's a, as much as it is Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan maybe taking the next step. I think Dwayne Casey, uh, for a coach, I think th- this has been a big learning experience for him. Oh, I totally agree. It's, I think it was, Brent Barry was saying it a lot during the, uh, during the commentary for the, for the games that Casey was proving himself uh, willing to basically throw any kind of lineup he had to out there to try to gain an advantage. And I mean, you know, we've done these podcasts the last two years in the playoffs. And the thing, the bell that we kept ringing was, why will he not change his plan of attack? He was so stubborn about it. And this, this playoffs has been like a completely different coach. And yeah, I, I think that having, you know, the new assistant staff and being uh, being given sort of a long leash by Ujiri to sort of coach the way he needs to coach played a part in that. But I think you're right. And it's something that it's very easy for us to forget is that coaches need to learn in the same way that players do. And they need their reps the same way as the players do. And having been an assistant coach with with Dallas when they won the title is great, but you're not the one making the calls. And it's taken him a couple of years, but I think I, I, if right after Kyle Lowry, I think he is the one who has grown the most uh, year over year in these playoffs for the for the Raptors. Okay, so I noticed you conveniently skipped uh, Demar Derozan uh, <laughs> with with that leap, uh, but let's talk about Demar Derozan. He, yeah. uh, uh, he, I mean, you know what? Like, you know, I'll be honest, man. Like watching this series, um, I've just come to the conclusion that I, he's. I just don't like his game. Mm-hmm. I just don't like it. Um, like there, there was this one play where Casey called timeout. I think in the second in the second quarter, and they came out of the timeout with essentially an ISO for Demar Derozan against Luol Deng, mm-hmm. a four-one clear out, and he scored on Deng. And I, I was just left shaking my head. I was like, "That's that's our go-to play." Please don't tell me that's not going to be our go-to play in the fourth one. This is a tight game. There's got to be something more than this. So I was so happy that we didn't have to run tight like you know under five minutes two-point game offense in this game because who knows how that would have gone. Mm-hmm. Um, DeMar DeRozan in this game was 12 for 29, um, you know, one assist, eight rebounds. So that's good. Uh, overall, talk about his series, man. What do you, what, what have you noticed from in the first two rounds from DeMar DeRozan? Like ha- any differences from last year that you, that you noticed? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think he's grown in the same, to the same degree that Lowry and, uh, and Casey have, but I do think he's grown. I, and I think he's even grown as these playoffs have gone on because I think, and whether or not the hand was sort of a blessing in disguise. The thumb was a blessing in disguise, but he 
would typically respond to not getting calls or respond to a bad shooting night by just forcing it like crazy, which he was doing way too often against Indiana. And they escape it because they're just a better team than Indiana. But as the Miami series sort of wore on, and I don't know how much he and Lowry or, or he and the coaching staff would, would commiserate about it, but he just sort of seemed to understand a little bit better where his shots are going to come from and not to worry about taking shots that aren't designed in that way. You know, I mean, we all kind of sort of groan at the, at the long twos from the, uh, from just above the free throw line, but okay. If you're designing the offense to get those shots and those are the shots that you're practicing specifically, I, I can live with that. The ones that would always kill me are the ones where he just pounds the ball, pounds the ball, pounds the ball. There's no angle to the basket. There are attracting double teams and he's not passing. And, as the Miami series wore on, I just think there was less and less of those. And I agree. I mean, his game is what it is. This this guy is never going to be um, Clay Thompson. He's never going to be a James Harden. He's never going to be that kind of that kind of guard. But he, you know, at least at this point, he's a known quantity. And and these playoffs, I think that he's taken enough of a step forward that I mean, they're going to resign him. You know, unless he decides he doesn't want to, their hands are basically tied. They have to resign him. So at least now you kind of feel like you have a bit more of a known quantity and you can make the adjustments around him that you need to make in order to justify that insane astronomical salary. Yeah. So let's talk about his improvements across the two rounds. Against Indiana, he shot 32 percent, being guarded by Paul George. Obviously, he's a pretty good defender. He averaged 18 mm -hmm. points. Uh, against Miami, he shot 39% from the field and uh, and scored 22 points per game. So th there is a there is a um, improvement statistically there. And I, I agree with you. In game five, six, and seven, you you saw a lot less of Demar wasting the clock for 15 seconds and then jacking something up. I think again credit to Casey there. I think he's put up he put Demar in different positions to succeed. I think you'll notice if you watch the game tape, and I have like. He's uh, th there's a lot more play calling where he's catching it off the off of a curl or somewhere around the free throw line area and doing something with it from there rather than just up top. And I think that that simple change in, in Demar's approach can make a night and day of difference. I know it's uh, I've, I've said this many times, but it, it really is a huge difference with him dribbling the ball up the court and creating something using a high screen or him coming off the ball and then catching it and doing something there. Those are essentially you'll see two different players depending on the type of offense DeMar is used to initiate. I totally agree. I, I know I completely agree. And I think that it's a credit to him and the staff that eventually, eventually, they realize that he's not going to be able to do the things he did during the regular season to get to the free throw line. Like that just does not happen in the playoffs at the same rate that it did in the regular season. So you have to get him proper shots. You can't just get him paths to the basket where the other team can just throw three guys at him, knock him down, and you're rolling the dice as whether or not you're going to get a call. They actually started to work his offense to get him proper open jump shots. And once they started doing that, I mean, he's never going to shoot a great percentage for you uh, as a volume shooter in the playoffs. But so long as he's taking the right shots, it means that now guys can be in proper rebounding position because they know where the shot's going to come from. Now there's some spacing on the floor. You know, there's 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 a trickle down effect to just taking the right shots rather than arresting the entire offense and now no one's quite sure what's going to happen it compromises your transition defense too and and yeah i, I it's it's sort of like the best way i could sort of describe for me with the way that DeRozan got to in the series is like it's fine you know there's definitely going to be a lot of people that just aren't satisfied with the way he plays and 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 there's a case you can make to that but i find that he went from a point where there was times during especially early early in the miami series where he was almost actively destructive to what they were trying to do to becoming a net positive and i think okay you know that's where you get to and now you sort of tinker and tweak and, and see what you can do next year yeah i, I think my, my my biggest complaint right now is uh and this goes ties back to him initiating the offense is, is the turnovers mm -hmm. he, he's so much less likely to turn the ball over uh, if he's if he's catching the ball and doing something with like one two dribbles versus mm. if he's doing it himself, there was this one play today where he tried to split the defense again, turned it over, and I think Tyler Johnson or Dragic was uh, this just came back and just laid it in in, in transition. It's it's mm -hmm. those kind of plays if he keeps to a minimum, I think fans' frustration with him go down. And somebody made a point on uh, on Twitter. Um, yeah, people make good points on Twitter. <laughs> uh, is, is, is that some of his shots essentially serve as turnovers because they're early in the clock, uh, mm -hmm. they're long rebounds, the, the Heat get them, and they're good at good at transition, so they run them back fairly quickly. 
Um, both fair points. I, I do think he improved statistically. And I think his his benching when Dwayne Casey did bench him, I think mm-hmm. that's a good time for him to kind of reflect on how the offense is working without him. And I don't I don't I don't, I don't have any proof that this actually goes into his mind and he comes the better from it. But it it just it has to like when when he's seeing Terrence Ross out there have that great game four fourth quarter mm-hmm. where they almost came back, it's got to resonate in his mind that look like w- without me the pl- the team is playing a certain way, the assists are higher. What can I do to to fit into that system more than make this team my and I play my system? It's a hopefully he gets it. Oh uh, yeah, and and I think he seems to be getting it. You know, and and it's it's the sort of thing where I mean I think we talked about this even last time we chatted, but it's you know he kind of goes into that me against the world mode not so much because he's an inherently selfish player or anything like that, but because he thinks in his mind that's the best chance he's putting himself and the team in the best chance to win because he thinks he can score every time he has the ball. And, you know, you kind of need that to reach a certain level as a player. But I think he's also now learning that there are limits to how far that's going to get you. And you still have to be able to read what the defense is giving you and understand where to put yourself and to, to be successful and to allow the team to put you in a position to be more successful rather than, you know, trying to just be the one guy that does it all because that's just not his game. And it's, you know, after two rounds, you could start to see like, it's too easy to game plan against that. And, and, you know, credit to him for adjusting because there are some guys who just don't. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm ultimately, I'm, I'm impressed uh, with his, with his growth. I mean, I'm overjoyed with Lowry's, but like, I'm impressed that, that DeRozan after, uh, after these years has sort of found a, a growth curve in the playoffs. Yeah, and, and one one thing that I would suggest to the Raptors is that sometimes their possession breaks down. It, it happens a lot. Their offensive mm-hmm. play breaks down for whatever reason. And at that point, with like six seconds left, you're essentially into an ISO situation where you have to create something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. When that happens, give the ball to Lowry yeah. instead of DeRozan. I think that's what makes makes his offense sometimes look worse than it is because in those situations, he tends to take the ball away from Lowry and that's why you see some of his shots. Like, yeah, I think he had the highest uh, field goal attempts again today. In those situations, if you, if you give the ball to Lowry, he's just so much better with his herky-jerky style of and his potential to drive a fo- get a foul or score at the rim or drive or do anything positive is just much higher than DeRozan. So, in those situations, we gotta we gotta switch over to Lowry. Yeah, agree. Well, I mean, because in that situation too, you're dealing with a guy in Lowry who's a better ball handler, he's a better shooter, and he's a better passer. You know, so these are all things that when the clock breaks down and you need someone to create a play, those are the attributes you want. You don't just want somebody uh, who is a good finisher around the rim and who can sometimes, you know, work the uh, the turnaround jumper. You know, you want as many skills at your disposal as you as you can get. And Lowry just has more of them. Yeah. Let, let's switch back to Bismack Biombo a little bit, man. He's a, he's a, he's the uh, Kyle Lowry is MVP and Bismack Biombo is MVP B in the in mm. this series to me because once. Uh, uh, Jonas Valanciunas went down and Hassan Whiteside went down. People thought, okay, that's it. It's a small series now because the bigs kind of cancel each other out. And mm-hmm. DeRozan had this uh, interview he gave after after Game Three, and he goes, well, you know what? We lost uh, we lost JV. They lost Whiteside. Well, we still got our rim protector there. It's Biombo. So that's an mm-hmm. advantage that we have to take off. That was his exact quote. And and sure enough, that's exactly how this series played out. Biombo was the guy that the Heat didn't have any answer for. Are you? I know I am, but were you surprised at how effectively Biombo ran the pick and roll and finished around the area? Um, because that was something he was not doing in Charlotte. He wasn't even doing that for during the year. He was better, but in the playoffs, he was absolutely sublime there. Every time he caught the ball from like running down the lane after Corey Joe or Kyle Lowry pick and roll or Lowry set him up, dare I say, I was confident that he would finish it. Yeah, I mean... I- I like I was I was so lukewarm on his signing in the summer, uh, mostly because of like his his reputation. I mean, and not like you know I've seen him play. Like he had stone hands, you know. The idea of letting him be a primary weapon in pick and rolls was almost laughable because you're only you're like you're rolling the dice that he's going to be able to catch the ball, let alone finish it around the basket. So the whatever work the team did with him as the season because even in his first like you know month or so with the raptors like you're saying he wasn't finishing that play and there was these cries for them to stop feeding him the ball and you know credit to him credit to the raptors that they they worked it they made it an effective weapon and i could it became one of the most uh pivotal options in the team's arsenal once jv went down because 
it did such damage to Miami's defense when they put Lowry and and Biombo in the pick and roll. I mean, he had 17 points tonight in a, in a game in a game that decided Miami's entire season. It's they not and it's not so much that like they allowed that to happen. It's the fact that the Raptors had so much trust in him that he'd be even in a position to get 17 points. It, it's I, I'm so I'm so impressed with the fact that he was able to kind of address that issue in his game. And then, like we were talking about earlier, that then eventually Casey got to the point where he was saying, you know what, this is my guy, this is our team, we've got to roll with it. And this is how we've been uh, we've been successful before. And, and the proof is in the pudding. They win the series. Yeah. And Bianco shot 65% in, in the play. I, in, in the uh, in the Miami series, and he took a bunch of shots, eight shots today, four in game six, uh, five yep. in game five, four in game six. So it's not like he's uh, the percentage is a little um, is skewed because of lack of shot attempts. He's he's taken a decent amount of shots, but mm-hmm. they're just good shots and they're in rhythm. And he's credit to him, he's he's gotten much better at catching the ball, and his finishing has always been strong to say the least. It's more like how he goes up, and like you saw, like he gets fouled pretty much. I was just going to say that he goes every, to the line. He, he gets he gets fouled a lot, and they don't even call it half the time just because mm-hmm. it's Bismarck Biombo. And and his free throw shooting hasn't been bad. Today was five for twelve, so today stands up. But generally, he's been around sixty percent, five for five in um in in game four. So it's he, they tried to play hack a hack a Biombo in this <laughs> game, but then he nailed both free throws. Yeah, yeah, it's. He, it's you know it's one of those things where and this is what people would always this is why people get so irritated with guys like Shaq and Dwight Howard is you don't have to be an 80% free throw shooter you just have to be good enough to prevent them from uh, from making this a viable strategy you know and that's basically what Biombo did it wasn't like he was lighting it up from the free throw line but he hits just enough that it kind of neutralizes that as an effective strategy and uh, yeah I mean. I, I again the fact that he also puts himself in a position to get to the line because when you're not a stellar stellar free throw shooter sometimes you look to maybe avoid that contact and he was inviting it he was inviting trips to the line and it didn't always mean that he was going to shoot a terrific percentage when he was there but you start putting the other team into foul trouble you discourage them and when you have a game like he did when he's uh shooting five for five or three for four the game before four for four in a game against indiana like that's just icing it's there's just there's a lot of little things that you can do with a guy like that even if they're not shooting 80 to 90 percent from the line did you enjoy his little battle with mcroberts i love it yeah he, he, was, it. he was getting visibly frustrated uh, uh mcroberts was because he thought that Biyama was fouling him wasn't the case really they were just playing physical and then he took it out with that flagrant one mm-hmm. uh, and uh, i think mcroberts had a couple of good moments in the series against uh, bebe um in, in two games and in Biombo, mm-hmm. he made him he made him pay for being a little too aggressive trying to block the shock a couple times but overall the Biombo versus uh, mcroberts um uh, just went Biombo's way, and it was interesting to see the Heat actually react to the Raptors and abandon their small ball lineup and get uh, McRoberts off. Because once they were getting killed on the glass and in the paint, they said, "The hell with it. We're the ones who need to change." Yeah, well, I mean, and I think you know Spolstra, I mean, he's a very smart coach, and I think that you know with the Raptors' reputation for maybe not being the uh, the the grittiest team, probably figured that they could afford to go small and not get killed on the boards. And there was times when that was true. Last game, that was true. But um, but yeah, but eventually the Raptors started to realize we have a massive size advantage and it doesn't always have to mean that it's the big guys getting the rebounds. It's just the big guys have to box out. And that's how you get someone like DeRozan getting eight rebounds. Um, so, yeah, I, and, and it's yeah, I, it, it was and the Raptors did so much today to get under the skin of Miami. And I think that was the most enjoyable part about it, because it, it, we spent so many years watching the Toronto be that team who got frustrated, be that team who let all these little things slip through their fingers and, and lose their cool about it. So it was a nice, uh, a nice growth moment to actually see them be that team and doing it to somebody else. Uh, what, what did you make of Dwayne Wade flopping twice in the series, blatantly? Uh, <laughs> one against Corey Joe when he tried to pretend uh, that his eyes were located on the top of his head. <laughs> and then today uh, where Biombo's elbow was about, I don't know, three inches away from his head, but then he grabbed mm-hmm. his eye and the refs actually bought it and gave two free throws. You know what? I, I almost find it funny at this point. Wade, like if I'm Dwayne Wade and I have gotten those calls for my entire career, I just I, I get it. I get why he does it, you know, and it's and it's easy to sort of say that, you know, it, it sort of sullies your reputation and all the rest of it. But, you know, he won a title against Dallas 
flopping his way left, right, and center and doing whatever he had to do to exaggerate contact. And the refs just kept eating it up. It's it's like a staple of his game. It's it's as much like one of his it's as much as one of his moves as like a Euro step is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Um yeah, by the way, Shaq won that series for them, mostly. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Cleveland for a bit, man. And um, does DeMar DeRozan's life get easier now that J.R. Smith is guarding him, or does it get more difficult? I don't know. And I think it really depends on DeRozan's mindset. Like, if he looks at a guy like J.R. Smith and says, finally, I've got sort of, you know, a, a weak defender guarding me, and this will allow me now to go back to playing a lot of one-on-one and I can, I can assert myself that way. Then I think you have a problem because Cleveland's schemes as a team will be able to neutralize that pretty quickly. But if he can take what he's learned at the end of the Miami series and apply that kind of discipline, I think he could be a big problem for J.R. Smith, uh, which would be terrific because you want to, as the Raptors try to get as many of their three point shooters out of the game as possible, because that's where the Raptors are really weak. So in guarding the three, so it just totally depends on DeRozan's disposition, I think, a lot more than it does on uh, anything that J.R. Smith can do against him. Yeah, and unless LeBron guards him, then it's a different... Uh, actually, that's a, who does LeBron guard uh, if, if, he, if, he, if he's look, sizing up the Raptors? I would imagine he probably winds up guarding Patterson. Mm-hmm. Um, and Patterson but, did a ph- phenomenal job against him in the last regular season game he played. Oh, for sure. And, I mean, the Raptors now actually having a couple of guys that can throw at him. I mean, it's LeBron. You're not stopping him, but at least you're not going to look down the barrel and see LeBron and think you have to have Terrence Ross starting against him. Um, but yeah, I would imagine they probably start him on Patterson and then we'll, uh, we'll shift him around uh, against guys like DeRozan and maybe even Lowry for, for a spell just to, uh, to throw the Raptors rhythm off if, yeah. uh, if need be. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know who guards. I think Damari Carroll obviously guards uh, LeBron. Uh, that's mm-hmm. what he's hired for. Uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, Patterson probably guards Kevin Love, and he is the factor that the Raptors haven't really had to deal with this postseason. Uh, A true stretch four. He's been shooting just insane from three, 48% from three against the Hawks, and then 40% against the Pistons. He had a fairly strong finish to the season. He's Kevin Love now is the guy that they originally had re-signed, and he's playing like it. And he's uh, the, even the rebounding numbers are there now, despite him being, him being a, a very perimeter-oriented. This this is a matchup that at least scares me, and and the, and, the, and I think we're going to be asking a lot of Patterson to actually contain Love, and I think that might be one of the key hinges that series kind of revolves around. Well, I'm even curious if there's going to be moments when they throw uh, Carroll at Love just to try to get the uh, the mobility against him. Love terrifies me in this series. I mean, Cleveland's three-point shooting in general does. I mean, the team is shooting at like 46% or something from behind the arc in these playoffs. It's absurd. And the Raptors are generally terrible at, at guarding the, uh, the three-point line. And so having a guy like Love playing the way that he is and with the Raptors not having an obvious matchup for him is, is really concerning. And uh, yeah, I mean, kudos to Cleveland for kind of figuring out their entire attack and having it click just the right time. I mean, if you're Toronto, what you hope is that maybe they've been resting just a little bit too long and uh, you can steal one uh, in game one. But, uh, but yeah, but that, but the Kevin Love situation, I mean, the Raptors sort of dodged a bullet um, this year, this, this series with Chris Bosch being out, but uh, Love is going to be a big problem. Yeah. Well, at least you don't have to worry about small ball here at all. I think there's going to be a, there's going to be a big at all times in the series. Uh, Kristen Thompson is, is playing there. So, um, there's no update from JV right now. I think he still remains um, out day to day. I guess it is. Uh, last time, Dwayne Casey spoke about it. He said he's nowhere close to coming back. So it's um, I, I don't know what it looks like for game one. But assuming you don't have JV and you go with Biombo again in the middle, uh, the the Thompson versus Biombo matchup definitely is something more natural. And I think even the Raptors might feel comfortable playing that way more than what they did against the Miami. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean that that's a very very a straightforward linear kind of matchup. And I think Casey would have no problem uh, going that route. I think so long as Cleveland has uh, Thompson in its center or Mozgov in its center, they're going to be fine with Biombo. I think it's those moments when they throw uh, love at center that they'll probably be very wary about keeping Biombo in. And that will be one of those interesting Twitter debates after a game when they, when, because it's inevitable, Biombo's going to be having a terrific game. 
They're going to go love it center. So he's going to take out Biombo. The Raptors are going to lose and everyone's going to just flip out because they should have kept Biombo in the game. That's going to happen at some point in this series. Uh, but yeah, but I think that that's the only time when uh, when you kind of lose the the chance of having Biombo out there on the floor is when they decide to throw Kevin Love at center. Yeah. Uh, the, the other matchup that can just just I'm looking at that Cleveland bench right now and it's not it's nothing it's nothing scary there but potentially they have we have a problem with Channing Frye who's another good three point shooter and the Raptors don't have anybody off the bench who can match up with him because if if Patterson's spending his time guarding Love uh, you need somebody to come out and defend Channing Frye who's a big guy not the greatest rebounder but definitely plays in the perimeter. Uh, and, and you need somebody there. So you might see someone like even uh, the Raptors go, you know, a little wonky and maybe put Terrence Ross on him because he's not really a threat on the boards. Or you could see James Johnson, lo and behold, uh, who always seems to have a place in every uh, in every matchup, but never really quite plays as much. Um, he might be a factor in the series as well because you, you have lanky guys off the bench for Cleveland who fit the, you know, the athletic three mold, which is what James Johnson was here to defend, at least before he got fat. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but no, it, it's 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 true, and I think that Casey will probably be a bit more uh, liberal with some of those with some of those matchups because you don't need to throw a big at Fry. You just need to throw somebody at him that can pay attention pay attention to him behind the arc. I, I'll be very curious to see if he throws James Johnson out there because when you started going down that path, that's the first name that popped into my head, even though he's barely played in these entire playoffs. Because with someone like Fry, you just need to get to the point where he's he's not open to take threes because if he can't be a factor at hitting threes, then he's not a factor exactly. and you basically can't play him. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of, of making sure that you're prepped in the way uh, for his arrival so that you just don't give him those easy open threes when he first checks into a game. If you can do that, I actually think you can do a good job uh, neutralizing him for most of the series. Yeah. And I, I think he is going to be their center quote unquote off the bench. Uh, and Moskov hasn't been playing at all. I think he's yeah. played a total of a couple of games, all playoffs and he's, he's essentially not a factor and you don't see uh, this series uh, him being a factor at all. There is an old Brooklyn connection here with RJ Richard Jefferson mm. uh, facing the Raptors again. Of course, uh, old Raptor fans might remember 2007. Was it when we, when yeah. we lost yeah, with, the, with the Vince Carter years? Yeah. That was well. I mean, you know, what what would these uh, these players, the Raptors, love to just go up against people that have tormented them in the yeah, past? Yeah, he he's a you see him being a factor at all for, for Cleveland. He's been playing limited minutes, only four minutes against the Hawks in the last game. Uh, you know, averaging about twelve minutes a game. I don't see him being a big factor so far. But against the Raptors, you could see them them throwing him out there because and forcing Ross to maybe defend him. But I feel that we're more equipped to, to guard their wings off the bench because we have some half decent defend, defensive wings in Norman Powell and dare I say even Terrence Ross. Yeah, I their their uh wing depth doesn't really concern me. And uh I mean Jefferson is one of those guys and I think it's actually kind of similar to uh to Joe Johnson in the last series where they're just not what they were. And and I think that uh it really shouldn't be I mean RJ may have like a stretch in one quarter where he hits a few shots and and People go kind of nuts because he shouldn't because he's, you know, old and, and not good. But uh, but yeah, but I think on the whole, there's there, there's no reason for him to have any kind of impact on this series um, as, as anything more than just a guy who sort of fills in minutes for uh, for LeBron and for Jr. And, 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 and the rest. It's just he's not it just doesn't have it anymore. And again, it's like one of those things where as a, as a, as a team, when you have the time to actually prep for an opposing team in the playoffs, it's just harder for a guy like that to sneak into a game like if just everything's too well scouted now yeah i think the key matchup here uh we'll talk about irving versus lowry just momentarily but uh damari carroll versus lebron james is is going to be the is it what the matchup a lot of raptor fans will keep their eye on because he was brought in here exactly for these matchups and and head to head <laughs> it hasn't been pretty for uh for damari carroll lebron's averaging uh 27 points per game uh on uh on 50 percent on 51 percent shooting against uh damari carroll so he hasn't really been able to slow him down. Last year's against Atlanta, it didn't really happen. Uh, but the one positive is that Damari Carroll is a very excellent one-on-one -on -one defender, mm -hmm. and uh, he's he's not he's not he's actually not so great at uh, defending guys who are moving without the ball because he tends to close out hard and and screw up here and there. But with LeBron in in, in this in this series or in the, in the previous two series that the, the Cavs have played, they're not really bringing him off a lot of screens. They're just essentially initiating the offense with him a lot. And uh, I think DeMar, that suits Demar Carroll because he's really playing Demar from a stop position. I know. I agree. I, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for them to play a little bit into Toronto's hands with that. And again, it'll be, you know, Demar at the point of attack and 
you know, the next two guys, making sure that they are closing out passing lanes and the rest. But I mean, with with a guy like LeBron, all you can really try to do is if he's going to get his 35 points, at least make it on a lot of shots. You know, it's you're not going to stop him. You're probably not going to even get him to shoot too, too badly. It's just it's for me with a guy like that. It's just a rhythm. Can you get him out of his rhythm? You know, I don't think you're going to have the success against LeBron that, that Carroll had against Wade in these last couple of games. I think you're going to have to be in a situation where you're OK to a certain degree with these stretches where LeBron is taking over games. You just have to make them a bit more infrequent or you have to make them so that they're just harder uh, for, for a guy like LeBron to actually pull off. And I think that's something that Carroll was getting very good at as the Miami series wore on, whoever he was guarding, was just making it harder for guys to do the things they want. Let them set up like two feet away from where they really want to be setting up. Let their drive be at an angle that's just a bit sharper than what they really want. If you can get that sort of stuff going, it can be enough to to accumulate a sort of disruption in their game. And, you know, I mean, it's LeBron. There's only so much you're going to be able to do against him. And, and I hope that there's an understanding about that from the fan base that, yes, he was brought in to, like, guard LeBron, but he wasn't brought in to stop LeBron. You yeah. know, no one stops LeBron. And also, I think they got to be a little more disciplined on defense and, and not send so much help from the weak side. I think even in Game 7 today, you saw that uh, the, the Heat got a bunch of wide-open shots. Uh, Joe mm-hmm. Johnson, uh, their rookies, um, and it was designed because the Raptors sent a lot of help from the other side, and they, they, they dropped down a lot. Um, LeBron, over, over his career, has becoming better is becoming better and better at finding the open man. I think his mm-hmm. zip passes from cross-court are just the best in the league. I, I, don't mm-hmm. think, I think he, he, he's got Curry beat in that regard. Uh, like when he's on the left wing, he'll make a you know pass to the right corner, like just zip it right through. Yeah. Um, and he's amazing at that. And he he can make the Raptors pay. And and the and the Cavs have much better three point shooting, so you might get away with it against Miami, not so much against the Cavs. So I think there's a there's a defensive mindset change too that's required. And and obviously dribble penetration, containment is is going to be big as well because I don't think you can you can get away with sending help against Miami, not so much against Cleveland, but just because they're a better passing, they're just a better team. Yeah, I mean, and, and what it really is going to come down to is they are a better team, you know, and they do have the kind of talent to pick you apart in those ways. You know, against Miami, because they didn't have the shooting, you were sort of OK with with those sorts of rotations. And against Indiana, when they didn't have as many uh, options around the basket, you were sort of, you know, like you can figure that stuff out. Cleveland has both. And and it's going to be very difficult for the Raptors, I think, to balance their defense because their natural tendency is to overhelp. And you overhelp against the Cavs, you were going to be drowned in a sea of three pointers. Exactly, and and I think Atlanta saw that um, or experienced that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 devastating, and it's one of those reasons why you kind of just have to do your best to not get spooked by anything specific that they do. You know, you can't let them get into your heads with a, like a, a a six point run or. Um, an eight point run where it causes you to really start compromising your defense in the, in the hopes of making like a a home run defensive play, because that's what they want. You know, this, the six point uh, run is not what interests Cleveland is that they want to use that six point run to break your brain and then turn that six point run into a 12 point run. And uh, that's just, that's, that's the hardest part of the discipline that the Raptors are going to have to play with. Uh, against Cleveland, even more so than just worrying about these individual matchups. It's not overreacting to these stretches and uh, and keeping your defense um, as as consistent and, yeah. and steady as possible. Keep, keep the tempo low, keep the pace low. I think just like Miami, one thing is true here, uh, a higher pace will favor the opposition and a lower yeah. pace will favor the Raptors. Totally agree. Um, Kyle Lowry versus Kyrie Irving, uh, head-to-head overall, um, Lowry's averaging 19 points on uh, 42% shooting, whereas Kyrie Irving is at 19 points on uh, 45% shooting. So it's, it's fairly even. Um, Lowry has the greater number of assists, steals, um, less turnovers. He Kyrie Irving has never posed a problem for Kyle Lowry, ever. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember watching the, even this year when he played him, he had a couple of big games, I think, against him. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this is not a matchup that scares me, even from the other way around. I think Lowry, even though he's a bit of a... Um, aggressive or over helpy defender. I, I don't think it's going to be Kyrie Irving that's going to kill the Raptors in the series. No, I agree. And that's even coming off of watching some of the games that Dragic had against them. I, I, Irving is not that guy for the Cavs. I mean, it's why them getting LeBron. I mean, there's a million reasons why them getting LeBron was amazing for, for what they want to do. But 
but but no, but Irving is is the kind of guy that is not. I'll put it this way: it's good for the Raptors if he starts trying to get into a one-on-one competition with uh, with with Lowry. And I think that the way that Lowry plays, and the reason why uh, he has tended to be kind of outplaying um, Irving when they played against each other, is that because Lowry is the head of the snake for the Raptors it can be hard to watch that guy seeming to dominate you. And when you're a competitor like Irving, it can be easy then to start get, getting baited into, well, I'm going to do it to you. I'm going to do it to you. And he has the talent to do that sometimes, but every possession where LeBron doesn't touch the ball is an advantage to the team who's guarding Cleveland. And I think that there's an opportunity there for Lowry to play a little bit of the psychological game against a guy like Irving. And, you know, you run the risk, yeah, of Irving, who is very talented, you know, obliterating you because he is talented. But again, it's a matter of, well, is it better to try your hand against Irving attempting to obliterate you? Or do you want it to be LeBron attempting to obliterate you? And I think if you've got the choice, you're going to choose Irving. And and in the Miami series, I was quite happy when Dwayne Wade tried to go one-on-one and try to take the game over. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that played in the Raptors' favor way more often than not. Yeah, he had a couple of big uh, big moments in game one where he scored and then uh, in game four, he had some moments, but I think overall, whenever you saw Dwayne Wade try to be Dwayne Wade of 2006 and try to impose his will on, on, on the on the team, it worked against Miami just because he's not the player he used to be. And overall, it was I think it was a net positive for the Raptors because Miami got out of rhythm. Dragic wasn't handling the ball, who scares me a lot more, and it worked out for the Raptors. I feel a similar connection here with Kyrie Irving that if he tries to win the game uh, for for Cleveland, it plays into the Raptors' hand because it means you're seeing a lot less of LeBron James uh, and a lot less of Kevin Love hitting threes. I want him to try to take the game over because I think that that works out for the Raptors. I totally agree. I'm in exactly the same boat. I, I think that Irving is a guy that can be baited into that sort of stuff, and I I just don't think he's good enough. I mean, and it's a, the the weight example is apt because the thing that ends up happening with a guy like that is that this is when you have to play the game of it's a seven game series. And you have to accept the fact that, you know what, in the same way that you will allow for a guy to hit a few shots in a game during the regular season because it's a 48-minute game and it's better for that guy to think, score first all the time uh, as, as a, over the course of the 48 minutes, it's the same sort of thing here. It's that, yeah, with Wade, you know, he was tremendous for some stretches, but like you said, is that ultimately what it did is it put a mindset uh, in his head that he could grab the ball and freelance whenever he wanted to. And at the end of the day, that worked out in the Raptors' favor. And I think that it should be part of Toronto's strategy to bait Irving into doing the same thing. It's to bait him into being uh, the guy who tries to win the entire series for the Cavs. And if he does it, well, then he does it. You know, it's, it's you know, not like the Raptors are coming in as heavy favorites. And uh, if LeBron manages to kind of talk him out of it, well, then at least you tried. But you know, if you can put yourself in a position to make this a Kyrie Irving se- uh, series as opposed to a LeBron series, you do everything you can to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Tim, we got to take some Twitter questions. So we got to take a quick break and come back after this. Get gold finger today. Here's the scenario. You've been injured in a serious accident. The doctor says your recovery could take months, maybe even years, yet your insurance company is denying your claim every step of the way. If something like this happens to you, call me, Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Personal Injury Law. We have offices in Toronto, London, Peterborough, and now Kitchener-Waterloo. Visit goldfingerlaw.com and get us working for you. Welcome back to part two of Raptors Weekly, which is also the Game 7 post-game podcast. The Raptors beat the Heat and advance to the Eastern Conference Finals, which start on Tuesday. And as James Slim on the comment section from the Quick Reaction put it, Tim, we're four wins away from being four wins away. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, about a quick programming note. Uh, a, a, a couple of months ago, I scheduled a vacation. Uh, starting on May 18th to 25th, I'm going to Mexico because I didn't think the Raptors would make it this far. And uh, here we are <laughs> with me set to miss the Eastern Conference Finals. So hopefully I can find a bar or whatever in Mexico and, and check some of the games out there. So you might see a, a dip in the podcast content over the Eastern Conference Finals, but uh, uh, but but somebody else might step up and uh, and take over the duties. But for now, we got to head to Twitter and uh, and take some Twitter questions. Um, ready for these, Tim? I'm already. Okay, some of these aren't even questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here, his uh, at C Gonzalez underscore 16 goes, woo. 
It's, it's true. It's true. Okay, it's, there you that's go. It's true. <laughs> okay. Um, at Azzy one goes. If we continue the trend, do we win Eastern Conference Finals in seven and championship in seven two? <laughs> um, let's say no. But uh, but I like the, I like the optimism. That, okay. That's that's fun. G- give me give me your Eastern Conference Finals prediction right now. Thanks to Ozzy one. Uh, I would say I would say Cavs in five. In five. I think the Raptors will will sneak one off, but I think that ultimately it's just going to be too much. Hmm. I see. I see. So I'll, I'll uh, I don't know. Let me wait till the end of the podcast to give mine. Okay. Okay. Um, at Dare to Milan goes. Uh, where does Lowry rank in terms of greatest rappers of all time? That's a good one. I mean, that's, I mean, it's interesting because it's what we were talking about earlier, and that he's not the most talented, uh, but I think he's making a pretty good case for the greatest of all time by virtue of the fact that he does he checks so many of the boxes. And I mean, now the team has gotten farther with him at the at the top than they have with any other guy. And uh, yeah, I, and he, and he's still going. I mean, it's not like you know he's still young and he's signed for uh for another year and yeah i i at this point and it might be the the uh the wave of optimism that's coming from a game seven win but uh, i think that he might have cemented his position in this game as the greatest raptor of all time here's uh here's what i here's what i think i think vince what he did was he took this uh franchise from the depths of hell Mm -hmm. onto something respectful so yep. the the delta from which Vince took this franchise from to where he took it to was greater. Yes. But Lowry has taken this fr- franchise to a higher plateau. However, he had something more to start with. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? That's that's very fair. Yes. So I think if you look at overall impact on the the team, the country, the the city, I think Vince is still there because his his impact can't be understated. Um, mm-hmm. Just w- like what he did for basketball in Canada and the Raptors in general, and it's it's huge. However, I think w- what you said is is Lowry actually checks off more boxes than Vince because he has that warrior mentality, which sad to say Vince didn't have or lost kind of. I don't know. He yeah. he has that. You know, I'm not gonna let my team lose this game. Where I've seen Vince in in some games, especially when he was injured that year, kind of take a back seat and you know quote unquote give up i don't think lowry has that in his personality at all and that's what makes him the greatest raptor ever because he 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 i think you put it perfectly he ticks more boxes well and the thing with vince too i mean i was working a lot around the raptors when uh, when vince was there and there the organization was afraid of him you know he got guys traded you know his his mother had free reign in that organization i mean there was a power and again you know the organization is complicit because they gave it to him but he kind of ran roughshod over the organization in a way that benefited vince more than it benefited the team um and even when you think back to when uh when the team when he really wanted the team to hire or at least interview dr j to be their gm uh it's that's one thing that that always sort of stuck with me more than you know than him wanting to be traded and all that that's that's whatever that happens everywhere but it was the idea that he was making moves behind the scenes that would really only ever benefit him. And that was one of those things for me that I think Lowry, as his status has grown in the team, uh, has never really caved caved to. And, and that's something that I very much appreciate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's move on. Uh, at yeah. Edohwin, E-D-O-H-W-I-N. Why, why am I reading his handle? I, it goes, uh, <laughs> how happy are we that this was such a convincing win? I'm pretty happy. I, I yeah. think uh, from a Raptor fan happiness perspective – I'm at an all-time high. Yeah. Oh, well, especially, I mean, considering the playoff series that had been leading up to it, uh, it was a very, very nice that to close out the biggest game this team has ever played with such a convincing win. Yeah. Uh, is this your happiest moment ever as a Raptor fan? Yeah. Yeah, I what would second? say so. What second? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? And I mean, it is, it's so sad because of what came after it, but it was when the team got the number one pick. Oh, really? The Bargnani thing? You know, it was just one of these things where it felt like... <laughs> that was a weak just... draft, though. We all knew that. But it was but it was sort of a momentum thing, right? Like, they'd gotten Brian Colangelo as their GM, uh, which was, like, coming off of what had happened with Babcock. It was was, like, 
it was so nice that that they were going to have that. You had a sort of ascendant star in Chris Bosh, and then they wound up getting the number one pick. It just felt like there was a momentum coming to the team, and and that things were finally turning around, and things were breaking in their favor for a team where things never broke in their favor. Um, but yeah, obviously that did not quite run. Is yeah. Yeah, my second favorite actually isn't even a game. It's uh, it's the All Star competition with Vince. Because I think yeah. that, that that was a night where I think the Raptors were center stage on the NBA, and you you don't say that too often. That's true. That was fun. Yeah, yeah that was fun. Uh, Brian Christensen at the B Christensen goes. Uh, I was stuck at work and could only follow the game on Twitter. What was the number one pivotal moment for the Raptors in this game? In Game Seven, he's referring to. Oh, pivotal moment. That's a. Do you know moment. what I I actually think it was? as I think it was the McRoberts flagrant because that was the moment when you saw that they were Raptors were in Miami's heads. And this was not a team that was locked in and was going to make a run and push against the Raptors and, and take another game down to the wire. That's when you saw that the Raptors were in their heads. Miami was panicking and that they were going to win the game. Yeah. For me, it was, it was a sequence. Uh, it wasn't an exact moment, uh, but it was mm -hmm. that sequence with the, where Biombo got the score, then he mm -hmm. blocked somebody, and then Carroll hit the three. I think it all mm. happened within about 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and, and which I think at the end of it, the Raptors had a 14 or a 13-point game. And um, I felt that was the shift in momentum that the Raptors needed. It kind of didn't break Miami, but it bended them enough where the next knockout punch definitely would, would bend them. And that, that, that was soon followed by the moment that you described mm. with the, when Biombo and uh, McRobertson got into that. So it was, a, it was that sequence which, was, which Biombo had a, had a big part to play in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, at Jeff underscore Winnipeg underscore goes, uh, if Raps get swept in the Eastern Conference Finals, is Casey back next year? Oh, my God. I hope that's a joke. It's, I mean, like the Casey thing has, has bothered me for years. Uh, but at this point, if he hasn't done enough to not only like earn his next contract, but earn a sizable raise to his next contract, then I don't know what he could have possibly done to, to justify one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you answer the question there, Tim? Because <laughs> at Jeff underscore Winnipeg underscore it requires an answer. Uh, if they get swept, uh, I, I think that Dwayne Casey will still very much be the coach next year. I think Nick Nurse might get poached from the Raptors. He's apparently very highly thought of across the NBA. And uh, I think, uh, you know, sometimes you don't really care about an assistant going the other way. But uh, if we lose him, it might have a material impact. Again, I have no idea what Nick Nurse does for the Raptors or... Mm -hmm. or I have some idea what he does, but I don't know what, what impact he has there. So uh, I think if we lose Nick Nurse, you might see uh, Dwayne Casey suffer a little bit. And I know that there were some rumors that um, a couple of his coaching assistant coaches might go rejoin Tom Thibodeau mm -hmm. or, or rejoin like somebody else. or I think, Scott uh, Brooks. Scott Brooks, yeah. So that yeah. might have an impact there as well. It might. But, you know, it happens. good teams do lose mm -hmm. assistant coaches, but, it, you know, then it's the pressures back on the uh, – the organization. I mean, fortunately, then it should also make it easier to attract new assistant coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck at at Semprini fifteen goes. Is it safe to say Lowry and Rosen are back? And then he goes uh, somewhat weirdly. If so, is it not a beatdown from the cat? Chuck, man, ask one question. Is, is, it, is it safe to say Lowry and DeRozan are back? I'd say Lowry's back, not so much DeRozan. I will. I would almost say that I do. Always, I don't. I don't use back is because I think this is new. Like I, you can't really like say what they did in the regular season is is what they should be in the playoffs because I I do believe it's a different kind of game and I think that what they've done is they've at least started to discover and Lowry has outright discovered what it is to play uh, at this level in the playoffs mm -hmm. and you know he'll get a, a a whole new kind of defensive scheme thrown at him and he'll have to find a way to adjust and 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 all the rest but. I think you're a lot more confident in both of them going into this series than you were them going into the Miami series. All right. Uh, and then uh, at Duck Duck Noose goes, uh, what do you think of Casey's choice to take out Carroll with five personal fouls? He didn't want off. I, I didn't even notice, man. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I, and I think that he probably would have thrown him back in if, if okay. they needed to, but they never really needed to. And this yeah. guy has got injuries at every part of his body. Mm -hmm. uh, any moments you can get with him uh, on the bench, I think you take them. Yeah. And uh, finally, Hod Bakshi, I'll be... I know this guy. I think I've known this guy since he was five years old. Yeah, nice. I know him, yeah. Uh, uh, he goes, uh, what combination of salami and cheese should I buy? <laughs> well, oh, Hod, man. first of all, you're Muslim, so you can't really eat pork, so you can't eat salami, so I'm uh, <laughs> assuming uh, something go. else. Go for it. What, what, what's your... What's your um, like, what, what, what's your 
post-game celebration when the Raptors win something. Do you have something you do, Tim, that uh, that you go, ah, it's a good win, let's just celebrate this way? Or is it actually a salami and cheese? It's definitely not a salami and cheese. I was not a Chuck Swirsky guy back in the day. But <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, not not lately. It's been, I feel like it's just been too many years. Like, I think when I was, when I was younger, I would have been, you know, much mm-hmm. more inclined to, like, watching with my friends we'd order like a massive pizza or something but now it's a game goes in, especially in these playoffs because all the overtimes it's like all right well now, now it's time for bed That's... Yeah. <laughs> I, I think my new ritual is that when a game is over like when i know it's over i just log off twitter nice that's my salami and cheese time to log nice. off twitter there's nothing going on here anymore it's decided that's fun actually you know what that that is that is a treat to yourself that is a good one <laughs> <clears throat> oh, sorry about that so I think with that, we will conclude the part. Oh, my prediction. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, I'd be a fool to uh, pick uh, the Raptors. I'd, be, I'd look like a homer, mm. which I kind of am, but uh, I wouldn't pick the Raptors to win the series. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I think, six games. I think we okay. actually sneak one in Cleveland. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. But do you remember against, against Philly how we snuck that game one out? Because yep. Philly hadn't uh, – I think they hadn't played for a couple of days and uh, – they were they kind of underestimated us. They've been sitting around a little too long, and and we snuck a game out. Um, so I think this Raptor team is actually plays generally better on the road too, especially mm-hmm. I think to start the series. Let, let's face it, home court advantage does nothing for us. Well, game sevens, of course it does, but for the first two games at home, we've always seemed to lose game one. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, so it doesn't really matter to me where the series starts. Obviously, a game seven at home is is a big thing. Is why you need home court advantage, but. For the first two games, if it's in Cleveland, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I'll see. I think you'll find a lot of uh, Raptor support traveling down there to Cleveland to, to boost sure. them a little bit. For sure. Uh, that might play into it. I, I do think that uh, DeMar, DeMar DeRozan has an easier matchup in this than he has uh, has had previously. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a positive. And I think uh, Kyle Lowry and uh, Kyrie Irving is something that uh, that can cancel each other out. And Lowry can even outplay him. I'm not scared of the the Cavaliers bench at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little confident that uh, Patrick Patterson can cover Kevin Love. Uh, Patrick Patterson has been an unbelievable defender. The way he guarded Joe Johnson for the majority of the Miami series was impressive. That's a guy who's quicker than you, who's got a bunch of offensive moves, yet he held him in check. So I, th- I think Patterson would find guarding Love on the perimeter easier. It's when Love goes inside the block that he might have a bit of a bit of a bulk thing going on. But overall, I think it's an easier matchup for Patterson. Combine all these factors together, and you know LeBron's due to have a you know maybe one or two off games, and you can see the Raptors sneak in a couple. Yeah, I, it's not crazy, uh, and and which is unto itself almost crazy, considering that again towards the, the start or to the middle of the, even the Miami series, you'd think that even the Raptors getting one game off of Cleveland sounded insane. But it goes to show you how much better they've been playing in the last week. Yeah. All right, so once again, Game uh, 1 is on Tuesday night. Uh, ESPN has the full coverage of the Eastern Conference Finals. I believe all games start at 8.30, I want to say. Um, and um, so no more TNT coverage. It's all ESPN from here on out. Um, check out, well, check out the post-game podcast for Game 1 where I'll be hosting. And after that, I'll be off to Mexico so somebody else will step in. Support Raptors Republic by going to patreon.com slash Raptors Republic. Do rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, and whatever mobile phone app that you use to listen to the podcast. The podcast continue at Raptors Republic throughout the week. Uh, Blake will be back with this thing. I think the Talking Raptors guys will be with the, with the series recap. So a bunch of stuff going on. Of course, check out RaptorsRolic.com for all your playoff coverage. Tim, thanks again for joining us, man, after a long time. I know. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, we'll talk to you after we beat the Cavaliers and head to the NBA Finals. Can't wait. All right, man. See you then.